All right, well, today we're back to work on the C6 Corvette competition drift car build. We have been hammering out the turbo kit on this thing. It's really the last big project, fab project that needs to get done before pretty much everything else can fall in line. So we got the hot side figured out. We got our wastegate merges in. We got our wastegates on. We got all of that done. However, we hit a bit of a snag. The flex joints I got to go in our crossover pipes were a little too long to get all the bends we needed to make this work. It's a really short run, a lot of curvature needed, which is why we ended up having to use pie cuts, and there was just not enough room. So I did find some shorter flex joints that should work, but I'm kind of at the mercy of uh, when they ship and when I get them. The only place I could find them short enough was eBay, and there was really no option to ship them faster. So we're kind of on hold because I don't want to weld the crossovers into the merge until we have those, because things might move around a little bit and I don't want to start building the downpipe until the turbo is fixed, until this is all done, because if we build the downpipe to this tolerance and then it moves a quarter inch this way or a quarter inch this way, our downpipe's not going to fit as good. We need to really nail this downpipe to make it very serviceable, easy to get in and out, and get the best clearance we can to everything that needs to not get that hot. So since we have to wait on that, we're gonna start working on some other stuff. Now, luckily, really the biggest thing we were waiting on was having the headers and the hot side done and the turbo roughly placed before we could do all of this other stuff. You know, we couldn't start running lines to and from our dry sump until we knew what the header was gonna look like. If it went way down there, then we might have to run the lines here or there. So that was really the biggest thing is getting the headers done so that way we can start plumbing, mounting the dry sump tank, so on and so forth. We also, Still have a little bit of work to finish up on the headers themselves. So we need to finish welding our V-bands, but I was gonna wait to do that because we need to drill holes and put in our individual EGT sensors. So I'm in the mood to keep the, the fab projects going. It's definitely my favorite. I hate when I'm deep down the road of a bunch of fab projects and I gotta go back to normal stuff. It's just like the fab ones the projects are so rewarding. So yeah, I'm gonna get my fix in. Let's uh, finish up these headers so they're done and dusted. And put these back on with our permanent exhaust manifold gaskets. We've got some temporary parts store ones in there just to get, get the spacing kind of close. Um, but that way we'll have the final ones in there since that will affect this spacing. Even a tiny bit to kind of make a difference. So before we finalize that, we really need to have this done. So let's uh, start marking and getting ready to drill our holes for our EGT probes. All right, so we have an entire kit. So this is the Holly eight channel EGT kit. Now we are running all Holly products for our electronics. So it makes things super, super simple. Everything's gonna talk to each other. Um, so we have a Holly Dominator ECU, we have a Race Pack Smart Wire. It really, it couldn't be easier. Uh, so basically what this is going to do is this is going to allow us to read the exhaust gas temperature of each individual cylinder. So we have eight of these EGT probes, eight of these EGT bungs, which is what we need to weld into the header. The probe will then slide in there and read our exhaust gas temperature. And what that's going to do is allow us to figure out what each cylinder is doing. If we're reading the wideband and the wideband says air fuel's fine, it might be fine, but that could mean one cylinder is really rich and one cylinder is really lean. Uh, this will allow us to spot problems, better dial in the fueling per cylinder, and just ideally allow us to catch a problem before we melt down a cylinder because this is a very expensive engine, which if it didn't come with this car, I don't know that I would have gone this wild, but I really want to keep this engine safe. So this is absolutely critical. Now, luckily, as with all Holly stuff I've used, it's a piece of cake. So we've got eight channel controller. These are all gonna plug into the controller and then the controller is gonna plug in to our ECU through CAN bus. So we'll really only have four wires going into the ECU as opposed to having to run each one of these into an input in the ECU. And they all plug into here and then this interpolates all that data and it'll send it to our ECU. Since we're using Holly stuff for everything, it'll all interface. Uh, so again, piece of cake. But what we need to do is weld in our EGT bunks. So it's gonna be really important that we make sure wherever we put these, we're not gonna have any interference issues. The last thing we wanna do is pull this header out, drill a hole, weld this thing in, and not be able to fit the EGT sensor. So we're gonna have to be real careful, make sure we mark everywhere we need them and then start drilling, welding, you get the idea. So 
I'm gonna quit jibber jabbering. We're gonna get to work. So we started mapping out where we were gonna put each sensor. Now we're trying to figure out a place where they'll all go in, but they'll also all be even. We don't want one an inch away from the head and then another one two inches away from the head. We'll, we'll want them to be somewhat symmetrical, somewhat even down the line. So once we had that marked out, went ahead and yanked the header off and then started marking out our holes. So again, this is critical. I, I wanna get this right. I don't wanna screw this up. It's always hard when you have to go back and modify and cut into and drill into and weld on something that you already built and you know, quote unquote completed. It's painful because you're like, I, I made it all the way here. I really don't want to mess this up now after the fact. So anyway, we got our holes marked. We got our holes drilled. Now this first one's tricky because the pipe bends immediately coming out of the flange. So I wanted to get it as close to straight as possible, but I can only go so far without having a giant gap. So we used some zip ties, held it in place with the probe, got it tacked in there enough to where it was close enough to straight. And the main reason for that is so that we can get the sensor in and out without pulling the header out. Now, not a huge deal on this header. We can easily pull this header out of the car in probably 10 minutes, but I wanted to be able to replace each and every sensor individually. Uh, I haven't really heard of these going bad. It's probably not something we'll have to change, but I don't wanna be in that position where we're having an issue, we need to change one, and we can't do it without pulling the header out. So that was really important. We got them all tacked in place, got it done, and then it was time to weld it out. Now the trickiest part of this was just plugging everything off to back purge it because the EGT Pro bungs are so small that you basically you're welding right against the tin foil and the tin foil is wanting to melt. Uh, so that was a little tricky, but otherwise these are pretty nice to weld. They're thick enough to where you can put some heat into them and get some nice beads, but they were also a little tricky because you're trying to weld all the way around it and get in tight cracks and crevices and running big stick out, but we got it done. We got them welded up and then it was time to move on to the V-band. So with welding V-bands, it is absolutely crucial to clamp at least the other side to it. So in this case, the other side has already been built with our hot side, so we clamp the whole thing to it, and that's gonna act as a big heat sink, and it's also going to just keep everything square and true. If any time I've welded a V-band without clamping it, it, it's like a 50-50 shot if it warps or not. And this is a V-band we cannot have warping because it's not just that we would have an exhaust leak. You can see the gas coverage there, nice. No uh, no sugar on the inside from the weld, but it's, it's not just that we would have an exhaust leak. We would have one pre-turbo, which means we would leak boost. So that was important. We got it done. We got the EGT bungs in. They look nice and snazzy. It's, I, it's silly. I don't know if it's just because it's such a functional thing, but I, I love the way EGT bungs look in headers, the whole combo. So we get the probes in. We get them just snug down in place before we put the header in just because it's going to be a little easier. And then we go ahead and toss our header back in with our new exhaust manifold gasket. So like I said, we've got our actual steel, multi-layer steel exhaust manifold gaskets, and it was important that we get these in before we finalize the hot side, because if they're a 16th of an inch thinner or thicker, that's gonna make a difference to whether the hot side lines back up or not. So with that done, we went ahead and mocked the hot side back up, got it fitted back into the turbo merge, just got everything in place, took a good look at it. It looks pretty snazzy to see it all as a complete unit. I love welding V-bands just because they weld it, they're so easy to make look nice. It's really kind of hard to mess them up. But with the probes in and everything, all business, the header is done and dusted. This header is complete. It's finalized. We don't have to mess with it anymore. Hopefully. Hopefully we don't have to. All right. One header done. Let's do the other side. So obviously the other side is a little bit trickier to get out just because of the alternator and how it's built and how it angles down. But we got it all marked out. Went ahead and started yanking it off, obviously. For this one, we have to pull the alternator assembly off too, but we've got it down packed. I still haven't found my missing socket. I'm missing my little quarter inch six mil Allen and it's painful, makes it harder. But we got it done, we got the header out. All right, I've got the other header pulled off. Gonna do literally just the same process. This one's gonna be a little tricky like that first one was on the other side. I'm gonna have to try to give it a little bit of angle just so we can get the sensors in and out in the car. Um, but other than that, pretty straightforward. So while I'm working on that, Josue is gonna start working on mounting the dry sump tanks. This is a big benefit we found out once we, one, committed to single turbo, but two, changed where we were gonna put it and where we were gonna run the downpipe. Originally, the plan was to run it out the fender here. Way back when we first decided to redo it, uh, it allows us to put the dry sump in here so we can open it and fill it from the engine bay and we can get down here and drain it 
We have checked from the tire. I mean, you can see it's inside the fender. Shouldn't have any clearance or any contact issues. So really happy with that location. That'll make our lives way easier because we just literally got to go from there to there. Uh, obviously a little twist and shimmy to keep it away from the header, but that's why we wanted to get the header done first. So the biggest thing is going to be figuring out how to mount it. So we've got the standard brackets, but we're going to have to do some something in order to uh, be able to mount this because we don't want to mount it to the fender because we want these to be easily removable. So we're going to try to avoid mounting anything to the fenders. That way we can pop them off the four bolts and get to everything like we can on that side. So yeah, start tinkering with this, see what we can figure out. But it looks sweet in there. I love the idea of having it in the engine bay. In the Miata, it's, it's in the trunk and it's to do an oil change. You got to pretty much take, take the tank out, drain it, then unhook the lines. It's, it's a pain. I have this special, it's actually a tray from a fridge to put that, the only thing that fits in there to drain, it sucks. So this will be way better. Moral of the story, let's get back to it. So Josue started working on some CAD, cardboard aided design to uh, come up with a plate to mount the dry sump tank setup. And I wanted to give him some design freedom on this just see what he could come up with on his own instead of trying to talk him through it. And uh, it's an odd one. It's an odd thing to, to mount. So I was curious to see what he came up with. So he started working on that. I started working on just welding the bungs out on this header. Same process as the other header. Same struggle with the tinfoil wanting to melt and get all chafed up and get stuck in the threads. It was... Definitely, I'm sure there was a better way to uh, back purge this and, and seal those off. But we got it done, moved on to the V-band again. These are so fun to weld just because you have this crack that you're welding down into and they're nice and thick and it, it's always satisfying to weld the V-band. They just weld so easy. But we get that welded up and then header number two is done. That means both headers are done. They're finalized. So we go ahead and throw the EGT bungs in this header ahead of time as well, just to make our eyes a little easier and start working on tossing it back on. Uh, it's a little bit tricky to get in here. It's a real tight fit up and we got to get the alternator back on, but we've got the header in. We're done. All right. We got the other header in with the EGT probes. All the EGT probes are in. V-bands are welded. Headers are officially done. Still got to get them ceramic coated, but otherwise headers are done which is sick. It looks really cool. We haven't put the alternator back on yet. It looks way cooler to see the header from up here. I'm like, why does it look so much cooler than it did? Is it just the EGT probes? Uh, but anyway, jibber jabber. Josue got our plate in. So this is what we're gonna mount the dry sump tank to. We may build a bracket here and mount to this fender arch. The plate's a little too far back. It's gonna put the tank too far back. We're gonna do some straps that kind of come up and bend and then have the rib nuts there to basically offset the tank where it needs to be. So now we need to mock it up and figure out exactly where it needs to be and then make those pretty precise because we need to get it as far in and as far back as possible, but it still needs to have the drain hanging just over the frame rail. And it's, it's tight to get all those things to be uh, copacetic. So see what we can come up with and start cutting some more metal, doing some bends, you know the drill. Since I welded some aluminium, let's see if I still know how to do it. So with the bracket welded up, we needed to get it all back in place and figure out where our rib nuts needed to go to hold the tank in exactly the right spot. And this is, I mean, they've gotta be really pretty spot on. There's a little bit of play in the bracket on the tank, so we can be a tiny bit off, but we really wanna nail this and get the dry sump tank where it's just supported, but I mean, fractions of an inch from the frame rail, so it's, it's everywhere it needs to be. There's tight tolerances on all ends. So we marked the first two holes, drilled them, put the rib nuts in, and we went ahead and checked the tank back on there to make sure everything was good, drilled our last two holes, put our last two rib nuts in, and then put everything back in the car. It's always a little tricky to get to these bolts, these mounting bolts on dry sump tanks because they're kind of behind it, but we got it done. It's bolted up. It's mounted, and not to mention, it looks killer in there, man. Perfect size for that location, and all the billet polish goodness seeing all this come together man it's like it's like a dream i can't even describe it. it it it's just wild you know when you get the parts and you have them it's one thing and when you 
got them on the shelf, it's one thing. But when you start putting them in and start seeing everything come together, it's like, dang, dude, dang, this is, it's real. It's getting real. So I'm, I'm pumped, man. I am so happy with how this thing's coming together. So we got the location licked. It's perfect, which that's 90% of the battle. We got it exactly where we want it. Very happy with that. However, we are going to have to brace it like we suspected. <laughs> The, there's just, the only structure it has is up in this corner, so it's got a, a good bit of flex. So what we're going to do is build a bracket to the inner fender arch. Now, like I said, I don't want to mount anything to the fender arch, so that way they're easily removable. However, the way we're going to do this is we're going to have a rib nut on the bracket, so the bolt will be from the inside, so it'll just essentially add one more bolt to taking the fender arch off. We'll zip these two, those two, and that one fender arch will come off, dry sump tank will stay because it's totally supported and it's just we're going to brace it so it can't flop around so it, it won't change much it'll just add a bolt to the process of pulling the fender arch off so yeah that's the game plan let's get this thing finished up because once we finish up the mount and it's finalized we can start playing with lines which has been something i've been eager to do for literally months now we've had our massive order of lines and fittings from Holly in this tote for a while, just waiting in the wings, waiting to go in the car. But we've been waiting till we finalize the turbo kit. So I, I'm really excited to start laying them out and see how we can do it. And it's gonna be fun. So anyway, I'm gonna quit jibber jabbering, get back to work, start making this bracket. You know what? Slight change of plans. Probably still gonna have to do the one to the fender arch. I'm gonna try to run one out to here, bolt it in. I think it'll still probably have too much flex, but it should help. And if anything, it, it won't hurt to have one there too. So let's whip something up for this. Should be pretty straightforward. Just a piece of flat bar. Get some more flat bar. I'm running low. This is all I got left. With the bracket welded on, it was time to reinstall it and see if we had taken the flex out of it. Now, we knew probably not, but we were giving it a shot. So we went ahead and drilled our hole. So when you have two pieces like this and you haven't drilled a hole in either of them, it works out really well if you're gonna rib nut the backside or drill through something else. I drill through both pieces at the same time up to the hole that the bolt needs to be able to go through. And then I take it off and for a rib nut instance, I drill it out to the rib nut size, put the rib nut in, and then you know that it is perfectly lined up. They were drilled at the same time, it can't be off, bada bing, bada boom. So we put it back in and as suspected, still got a little bit of play, unfortunately. Now again, this was not anything that we didn't foresee. It was worth it to add another bracket, but now we've got to change our plan of attack. We've got to add that one to the fender arch, which I was dreading it, but we're gonna make it work, we're gonna make it easy, we're gonna make it serviceable. That's the name of the game. So we get our bracket marked out, uh, just a simple little four inch piece of flat bar. Like I said, I am running low on this stuff, but 
we should have enough to make it through this project. So we go ahead and cut that on the bandsaw. Aluminum is so nice to work with because it cuts, it bends, it grinds so easily compared to steel. The only difficulty is it's a little trickier to weld, but I really like working with aluminum when I can, and obviously it's a lot lighter. So we get the main shape cut out. It had to be kind of an odd shape to clear everything and have the, the most room possible. We get it ground down, and then we go to tack it in, and this is where things get tricky. With aluminum, with a steel bracket, you could use magnets to hold this in place, but with aluminum, you really can't. So luckily we were able to get a little bit of a fusion tack. We threw a couple more tacks on it. We went and checked it. The way we put the tacks, we were able to bend it a little bit and get it to kind of the exact angle it needs to be as if we were tacking it in the car. Pulled it back out, welded it. We had to be careful we didn't weld too much on the other side because then it would pull and then it wouldn't fit. We ground it down, and here is our final bracket. You can see how we have the rib nut in the bracket itself, so that way the bolt's gonna go through the fender into the bracket and just be simple to remove, not having to hold a wrench on one side or do anything like that. So now it's time to install it for hopefully the final time. So we get it all bolted up. They all went in pretty easy besides the one through the fender arch. It was just a little tricky to spot. I couldn't really see it, had to turn the wheel, but we got it done. They all lined up. They all bolted back in. Now it's time to put the tank back in again. And like I said, it's always a little tricky to get these bolts started just because the tank's round and the brackets end up behind it. So you've got to kind of wrap your hand around it and we've got it in this little cubby. So luckily the extension with a wobble with an electric ratchet, all that combination made it not too bad. We got it in, it's done. All right, dry sun tank officially complete. Super rigid in there now, still very serviceable, easy to take off, lightweight. It, uh, it turned out really good. So now it's time to really switch gears and start working on the plumbing. Uh, something that really helps me is to do kind of a mid-project cleanup, especially switching this drastically from you know, doing fabrication work or there's metal shavings and you're cutting stuff and marking stuff to plumbing A and line. So we've done a reset, we cleaned the workbenches off, we put everything away. Now we get to start fresh, and that's a good thing because we have a lot of lines and fittings here, and we need to kind of sort through them, figure out exactly what we have and what we want to put where. So uh, I guess let's dig into this box. All right, we have a small portion of our overall fittings up here. Uh, this is just the Dash 16 stuff, which granted, that makes up a large portion of it because that's most of the oil stuff and all of the coolant stuff. Well, besides the turbo, there's a lot. There's a lot of lines and fittings is the point. I counted and not counting the fuel system because that's a separate order, separate list. 28 lines and fittings. Now, luckily, we shaved four of those by moving the tank into the engine bay. So that's going to help out a ton before we're going to have to go line to the pass-through at the firewall, and then another line from the pass-through to the tank. So we eliminated all that, now we just have four lines from the dry sum tank. So dry sum tank to breather tank, which we still have to mount, return lines, and then our feed line. So that helps things out a lot, but it kind of messes up my plan, because I kind of forgot about these that we need to put in there somewhere. So these are scavenge filters. So these are gonna go on the return side before the tank to catch and trap any big pieces of material so they don't get sucked back through the pump. Uh, now my plan was to put these at the pass-throughs and then run the lines directly to them. Now they're gonna have to go ideally at the tank. If we mount them somewhere in between, then we're gonna have to make eight lines instead of four. Well, six lines. Point is, we're gonna have to make more lines, they're gonna have to mount them, they're gonna be two really short lines. I prefer not to do that. So I've come up with a couple options. I think we've got enough stuff to make it work. So we got all of these lines and fittings off Holly's website. So this is all Earl's Ultra Pro. Uh, these are really, really nice quality lines and fittings. I've mentioned it before, uh, the Holly's website is kind of like a cheat code for uh, ordering and stuff. I always hated it before. It was so hard to find certain things. You'd have to know exactly how they listed it, what it was called. Otherwise, it was just so difficult to find. Some stuff I didn't even know existed, I found by using Holly's website. I wanted, let me show you how easy it is, right? So this just blew my mind. I was like, man, I've been doing this wrong for years. So Holly's website, holly.com, categories, plumbings and fitting and hose. So let's go there. I just like to pull it up like this. Uh, huge props to the guys developing this website because they did such a good job organizing this. So we have our different 
types, right? So, you know, like Ultra Flex is mostly crimp, Ultra Pro is crimp and PTFE. Um, and then we have push lock, we have regular just AN rubber hose, we have power steering, we got tools, but this is where it gets really cool. So let's say you're looking for a specific adapter. Let's uh, come up with an example. Let's say we need an eighth MPT to go into this port here. Cause we wanna run, we wanna feed our turbo off our oil filter housing here, let's say. So we need eighth MPT to six AN. Well, instead of trying to figure out how to search that, we just go here to adapters. And then we'll go MPT to AN adapters. Uh, we'll probably take a straight one. And then we could probably find it pretty quick just searching. Let's do it this way. Adapter size A, we want 6AN. There we go, 6AN to 8th MPT. Now we can even narrow this down more if we had a bigger list to sort search through. Now this is all our 8th MPT to 6AN fittings. But anyway, I know there's a whole lot of jibber jabber. I just, that literally has been a game changer for me. Not only finding what I need, but finding stuff I didn't even know existed. If I had to do this without knowing about Holly's website and ordering stuff off there, it would have been way more difficult. Probably would have taken me four or five batches at least to get everything I need. Whereas I'm pretty confident we have everything we need. And like I said, I found stuff that I didn't even know existed. So for example, the dry sump lines which we're working on now, we're going to be using crimp fittings. So there's a couple different types. We have PTFE fittings here, which these are like your normal AN deal. We're gonna build these ourselves. We're gonna tighten down the jam nut. Boom, we've got our line and fitting. These are crimp fittings. So we have these collars here. This is gonna slide onto the hose. The collar is gonna go over, crimp down, and that's how it's gonna lock it on. So the cool thing about these is they're more low profile, but they also have fittings like this. So this is an ORB90. This is going to be the end of the hose. So instead of having this fitting, thread onto that fitting and the dry sump pump, this is going to replace that fitting. So basically the line will thread directly into the dry sump pump, cut out the middleman, and give us a lot more clearance to the header. So we should be able to keep these lines nowhere near the header. They won't even know the header existed. And again, that's something I didn't even know this existed. So I was looking around on their site and I found them. I'm like, whoa, that'd be perfect. So because of that, like I said, we're gonna use crimp on the dry sump lines and then PTFE, regular, whatever you wanna call it on everything else. Now, the reason I didn't do crimp on everything was just because I don't have a crimper. We're gonna have to send them out to get them crimped. In hindsight, I kinda wish I did crimped on everything, but one of those things. We'll have crimped on the really, really important stuff. So yeah. Enough jibber jabber, as I said before, I don't know I was lying when I said that. Uh, we're gonna start mocking this stuff up. I've got a couple different ideas of how I wanna integrate these scavenge filters and where our lines are gonna go. So I wanna mock up both ways and just kinda see what seems like it's gonna work best. All right, so here's the best solution I came up with so far. So we got this one 90, this one going straight, and then a 45 out of the bottom for the feed. So again, these are our two returns. That is our feed to the pump. I wish I could do these the same, like either have them both straight or both angled down, but there's not enough room to 90 this one and the fitting not just run into the frame rail. And then this one, there's not enough room to run it straight because then it runs into the valve cover. So it's it's tricky. I, I don't, I'm not necessarily in love with it. It kind of bugs me <laughs> to have the different thing. Before we commit to this, um, I do want to try putting these down on the frame rail. With it being so short, it's like, it's gonna have to flex a lot to line up. Just pulled the uh, fender arch off and you can see the dry sump tank bracket in here. It honestly worked out doing that one, so when we do take the fender arch off, it has a little more support in here. But it looks cool to see it kind of free floating back there in the corner, not all hidden by the fender arch. All right, so what we're gonna do now is go ahead and throw our fittings in the dry sump pump. A 45 
and a 90 in there. So the 90 is a little bit more restrictive. So ideally we want to use the 45, but we're also trying to keep it as far away from the header as possible. So I think we've got it determined that we're gonna use all 45. So we got a 45 that's feeding the pump down at the bottom and then two 45s out. You can see we still got plenty of room to the headers. Uh, so another thing we need to figure out before we start hacking lines and putting stuff together is what can we fit over here? So obviously our original plan was to put our breather tank here, which I mean we could make it like floating, but we run into the same problem where the line's two inches long. So I'd like to put it over here. So we'll run a line behind the intake back over here but we need to put the oil filter housing in real quick and see what that looks like. Yeah. I mean, we can put it down in this box. Things are concerned, we've got to come out of the oil cooler and into here, and then out of there. It's kind of six and one, half a dozen of the other, because if we put it over here, it's really close to the header, which is going to be even hotter. You know, I did like this spot for it. And then you could probably put it as, as far over as here. Well, we're changing our plan of attack here. So I got these, like I said, when I was planning on putting the tank in there. So now that it's here, as you saw, not the most ideal setup. We just gotta use so many fittings, a 90 to a union, to this, to that. So I found they do make basically the same thing, but with a 90 built into it. And they're a good bit shorter, so we should be able to do both of them, you know, somewhere this way, both angled that way and then the lines, everything will be symmetrical, which will make me a lot happier. <laughs> Just for those reasons, but then also, that'll give us room, hopefully, to put our breather tank somewhere around here. It'll be a pretty short line and pretty tight turn, but I'm confident we can get it. We should have enough room to put it here, which would be great because we haven't really found another place to put it yet. Since we're gonna be waiting on those, we do have another special guest part to install. So these remote water pump outlets we have, the top two need to tie together and the bottom two need to tie together. So what we were going to do was run two 12 lines and then I was gonna build some sort of aluminum merge for two 12 down to single 16, then a single 16 line to the firewall, bulkhead through the firewall, bulkhead through the firewall, to the radiator in the back back here. Now that's obviously not ideal because now we've got six lines in the engine bay, 4-12 and then 2-16. So Soy found a deal that's gonna allow us to just go straight to dash 16. Uh, it's really nice. I haven't really looked at it that much, uh, but I'm gonna see if we can throw it on with this stuff still in the way. Let me show you what we got. So we have this. So it's from 417 Motorsports. So luckily I was able to get one. They only do these on a pre-order. And I put off ordering one for a while because I'm like, ah, I'm not gonna have it in time. And then I finally just bit the bullet, ordered it, and luckily I got it in a week. So I was stoked on that. But the cool thing is we can go out either way. So these two channels tie together. So we can run both lines out here, both lines out here, four lines out, or a line out here and a line out here. We can do it any which way, which I just thought of that. We could do one this way and one this way if we need to. Uh, but I wanna get this in there and get an idea of what we can do. Don't judge me on the blue fittings. This is what they had in the stock for 16 to 16. Ella, don't eat stuff over there. 
The whole gang's here. Right? You all got the little stickies on your face. Oh, okay. Hi, Giggies. Our ideal goal here is to go underneath the intake. And the reason for that is because we want to go through that plate back there with our pass-through. It's just the best way to stay away from headers, heat, and not run on top of anything else. Otherwise, they're going to have to go over the valve covers or over the fuel rails or <laughs> over here somewhere through this mess of stuff. So that's my ideal scenario. Now, that's obviously a pretty tight curve there, but this Earl's convoluted stainless line is super, super light and incredibly flexible. So I'm pretty confident we can get the bend we need, but we only know when we start plugging and playing. So at least we got that in there and it should work. We're also gonna be able to feed our turbo off of this because it has eighth MPT port. So we can go with our steam port into here. One of these will go out to the turbo and then we'll have to go with the low side back into the back in from the turbo. So we'll have two 6AN lines. It's gonna get busy real quick. We started mapping out the uh, coolant lines. We've got a pretty good road map as far as the coolant and the oil is concerned on lines and fittings. I do need to get some dash six stuff for the turbo uh, coolant lines. But other than that, as far as we can tell from mapping it out, holding the fittings in place, which is important because you really don't know until you put a fitting there and see. You know, like we thought 45s might work behind the firewall, but it would just put the line way out in the middle of nowhere. But doing all that, we have everything we need. But anyway, I'm jibber jabbering on. Feels cool to uh, see all this stuff filling up the bay, man. It looks sweet. It's, it's a catch-22, because on one hand, it's so nice when it's all bare, and you're like, ah, there's not much more that goes in there, and then you start putting stuff, and you realize how much more stuff's going in there. There's a lot of stuff going in this bay, but on the other hand, it's nice to see it getting closer to a complete running driving car. So, yeah, we're just gonna have to do our diligence, try to plan everything out as best we can to make this thing as easy to work on as possible, and as reliable as possible. So, anyway, hopefully my flex joints get here tomorrow, and we can dive into that switch gears and start, finish building out this turbo kit, get the downpipe done, but we'll see. All that's still to come. Uh, I really would like to get the turbo kit knocked out as soon as I can. If we're not waiting on anything, that, that's my first priority. So anyway, hope to see you guys for that, but for now, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, goodbye.